GSMR's board of directors. It is my sincere pleasure in this and being participating in this collaboration with EPT Clean Oil in association with our GSMR Virtual Academy. You know, the GSM, GSMR Virtual Academy recently completed its one year anniversary. And during this year, we celebrated many milestones. The most important one is we had the opportunity to collaborate with many professionals, not only from regional organizations, but from international ones as well. We had the opportunity to work with these professionals from various fields, not only oil and gas. We're talking about aluminum smeltering, aviation. Uh, we had sessions in energy and electricity. So a lot of technical engineering backgrounds. We had the opportunity to actually train more than 100 people in our training sessions and influence more than 2,000 members and guests in our technical webinars. You know, we've seen a significant increase in our followers and our members during this past year. And it was just a great benefit for us to have this virtual academy, especially during the COVID days. And during this year, with the main point, main purpose that we had is we stay true to what we wanted to achieve. What we wanted to achieve is we wanted to create a knowledge sharing hub for professionals from varying points in their career. So if you could be in your peak of your career or you could be a recent joining engineer or professional, the GSMR Virtual Academy was a hub where people could collaborate, share ideas, share best practices, and most importantly, network. So that was the main purpose that we wanted to achieve. I personally achieved a lot from joining the GSMR. You know, the networking, the people that I met, you know, allowed me to make collaborations between their organizations and mine. So not only did, my, did I benefit from joining the GSMR, but my organization did as well. So with the ongoing support of our board of directors and from our members, we're going to continue looking forward to creating these events, creating these associations, creating these virtual seminars where everyone could attend and gain from it as much as possible. And thank you all for whoever has supported us and joined our events. If you would like to learn more about the GSMR, look at our social media, reach out to us. We're always looking for professionals to expand our horizon, expand our networking capabilities, and just get going and learn and network as much as we can. So I hope uh, the uh, I hope the session is can get can we can move forward, and uh, I would like to thank everyone for listening, and I'll give it back to the presenter. Thank you guys. Hi everyone. Um, my name is Moira. I'm not the presenter. We're just navigating a technical issue. So if I can just ask everyone for about two minutes, we're just trying to rotate in a presenter. Unfortunately, Kashar, due to VPN issues, is not able to connect. So we're just going to switch over the presenter to Peter uh, Dufresne, who is the CEO and VP of EPT Clean Oil. So if you just be patient with me, we're just trying to get him connected here. So I'm going to turn off my video momentarily and we will be right back to start. So uh, welcome. Thank you for attending the webinar today. Our topic is oil analysis for turbo machinery, uh, managing the lubricant as an asset. It's a great, great privilege to be here speaking with you today. Uh, sorry for the technical issues that we've had. I'd like to introduce my colleague today that's uh, co-presenting. Uh, his name's Kashar, and uh, we've worked for a long time together and very successfully in uh, a number of countries in the Middle East. I'm sure most of you have uh, know Kashar already. Uh, just a little bit about our company before we get into today's topic. Um, our company started in the mid 1990s, and if you would have asked me uh, in 1995, if I would have spent the last 30 years uh, perfecting uh, turbine oil and compressor oil maintenance, I would have told you that it would be impossible. But this is the, the path I've been put on. This is the road I'm, I'm on, and it's been an incredible journey, and I'm excited to share a little bit with you today. Uh, my father, who co-founded the company with me in 1995, worked for 30 years as a fleet maintenance engineer on 100 turbo compressors in Canada. And what he discovered was that the maintenance on the lubricants was really limited to particulate filtration. And, and what he discovered was that particulate filtration cannot address the root cause of failure in lubricants, which is oxidation. Um, so he invented the opposite of a particulate filter and used ion exchange resin technology to remove the dissolved oxidation material and, and, and solve the, the underlying cause of both lubricant failure and the mechanical failure. 
So since then, we've expanded the technology into over 2,000 installations in some 40 countries, and the cost savings have been extraordinary. When you reapply your maintenance and target the root cause of failure, extraordinary things happen. Um, we're on the biggest power plants on Earth in both nuclear, fossil, and more recently, we've been doing uh, large compressors, uh, gas processing, large airports at the back of power generation. And the one thing that these all have in common is the root cause of the problem is oxidation. So I, I know it's, I, I've repeated myself there, but when you can target the root cause of failure, things, um, you can get control. You can change it from an unmanaged condition to a managed condition. Um, we've worked with some of the OEMs in the world. Um, we've been brought in as uh, uh, expert witnesses in, in critical failure analysis and, and understanding of what the issue is. And in this regard, we, we've worked with some of the largest facilities. Um, here's a picture of yours truly on the bottom left hand corner in Oman. The Oman experience was really uh, eye opening for me to understand just the level of infrastructure investment that is uh, has been made in, in, in the number of turbines in the Middle East is beyond our comprehension. In Canada, we're a very small country, so we might have facilities with one or two turbines, maybe five turbines. But when you go to the Middle East and you see 10, 20, 30, 30 turbines at one installations, um, the opportunity for optimization um, and to really redirect the lab analysis and the maintenance just a little bit um, can can have extraordinary impacts on the operation and the return on investment in these companies. Uh, just a couple photos of our crew. Uh, we've been all over the place together, uh, working on customer issues and um, solving problems, which is really what drives our business forward. And it's the greatest pleasure in, in my uh, experience is working with people from all over the world, understanding the issues, looking at the oil analysis, understanding what more we can learn from that oil analysis and, and how to solve these problems together. Um, Kishar received the chairman's word of excellence from the chairman of PDO. And, um, you know, our job is to really share this experience with you. If, if, we, can, if we can do that, then incredible things can happen. Uh, some recent cases with varnish, and, and this would be really not even a really bad one, but the bathtub ring, we call it here, or the oil ring um, from lubricant deposits. Now, the interesting thing here is the varnish is not really well understood. Um, varnish occurs when you don't take control of oxidation, okay? When you allow oxidation to do its normal process, it's going to generate materials that are dissolved in the oil, just like salt is in the seawater. And it's going to accumulate to a point where this occurs. Okay. So this is not an oil problem. Okay. This is a maintenance problem. And what happens when you don't manage oxidation? And if, again, if you look at typical lube oil maintenance in turbo compressors um, or gas turbines, steam turbines, uh, this is not being controlled right now. So this is the, the greatest uh, advancement and step forward that can be made is to put these unmanaged situations into a managed situation, okay? And if you remove oxidation material as it's generated, this can't happen, okay? Um, you know, the last picture wasn't very serious, but when this starts to happen on bearing surfaces, um, it, it's incredibly um, disruptive and catastrophic to the producer. Um, you know, these turbines uh, cost $700 a kilowatt to make. Um, and by the time you have a $25, $50 million investment, um, that machine needs to be running for the company. It needs to be running, producing revenue for the company or facilitating the production of the company. When deposits start to occur on bearings, the temperature is no longer distributed evenly and you get a hot spot and you will get a failure. Okay, again, this is completely unnecessary. And if you put the oil in a managed condition where you are addressing this oxidation material and removing it as it's generated, this can all be avoided. There's a bit of a misconception out there 
that varnish occurs only in some applications. And for the longest time, uh, users in industry were saying that if I separate my lube oil application from my hydraulic application, then I won't have varnish. But you know, here's an application from the one of the most advanced, modern, 60% efficient gas turbines in the world. And this is from a system where there is no hydraulics. Um, it is separated on a different, different, a different system altogether. And this does occur and it will occur and it will occur everywhere. Uh, again, um, most compressors and turbines in the world are in an unmanaged condition with respect to oxidation. And until we get a hold of oxidation and manage it, we test it and, and manage it, um, these problems can occur. And it's the biggest avoidable failure you'll have at your sites. Okay, I, I've been getting the calls from around the world. Peter, we've had an $80 million failure. We lost the refinery for a week because the, the extraction compressor went down from varnish on the bearings. And it's like, well, are you testing for varnish? Uh, we're not sure. And then, you know, we look at the lab analysis and we, we see that the testing they're doing is, is not following the correct international standard or there's some other issue. It's like the lab analysis that we're doing on fluids is our lighthouse and, and we're on the ocean and we're looking for shore and we need to be able to see ahead. We need to be able to see the horizon and lab analysis is our greatest tool to do this. So part of what I wanted to get across today is to make sure that the lab analysis that you're doing is, is on point and uh, you're able to extract as much information as possible from that. So that this situation can never happen. So let's get into the oil analysis. I can't tell you how many times I've been to a site and the users um, have not been trained in oil analysis and they don't know how to interpret these. Okay. So um, it's really important that you're covering off the right test at the right time using the right test method. Um, basic interpretation can be used to then uh, understand how I'm doing relative to the industry guidelines, relative to the industry specifications, uh, to find the, the weaknesses and address them. And normally these can always be ad addressed uh, months or years ahead of an operational problem. You don't have the operational problem typically until the, the oil analysis um, has detected um, a limitation or, or something that should have been done much, much earlier. Okay. So you might be surprised to learn that when you do send an oil sample into the lab, that quite often, um, a human set of eyes is not looked at the data. Okay. Um, we're using now, uh, computer algorithms and, and basic, uh, reporting so that the numbers get put on an Excel spreadsheet and then get accumulated and turned into a report and sent to you without a set of human eyes ever looking at it. Okay. Um, the, I guess my starting point is always, um, you know, to look at viscosity. Viscosity is the number one cause of failure and you can't fix viscosity. So if your viscosity is wrong, um, you know, you need to take corrective actions immediately. I would retest that plus or minus 5% uh, is what I'm looking for. In some cases, you can go as up to 10% because there is some variability in the test. But low viscosity is, is typically um, suggesting insufficient lubrication film and the lubricant can't do its job. So that would be more of a concern than, say, 5% too high of a viscosity. So where to start? Um, Every lubricant application is going to have different requirements and different test methods. So you're going to want to look at your uh, OEMs. You want to look at industry standards. You're going to want to look at the ASTMs, um, and you're going to make make sure that you're focusing on testing what is needed to be tested and when. Okay. ASTM. Um, stand, used to stand for the American Society of Testing and Materials, but it's actually uh, predates ISO. It was created in 1902, and it's the oldest organization in the world. Um, so it's it's not it is an international organization that is the governing body for oil analysis, test methods, and in-service guidelines, which would tell you what to test and when to test it. 
and I can't speak highly enough. Uh, it's people think that I'm getting commission for ASTM, but um, I am not. ASTM is the sum of all human knowledge in this field. Okay, so experts from around the world have already answered all these questions. And to get something approved on ASTM, it has to go through a voting process that's very, very detailed. And any one vote, no, can derail the entire project unless the entire committee and the entire group is able to overcome that one no vote. So when you get an ASTM standard, it is absolutely robust and it has been through three or four balloting processes to get approved. So you can trust it. And the, the people and the quality, the, the top organizations of the world all have their leading people on these committees to establish these guidelines. So you can take great confidence. Um, what's exciting is that for $40, you can pretty much buy any standard on ASTM today. You just log on to the website, you create an account, you can get a membership. An expert tip is for about $50 a year, you can get a membership. And with your membership, you'll get um, one of the volumes of the standards. Each of the standards is about $40 to $50. But if you become a member, you can probably get about 100 to 200 of these standards included in your membership. So um, this is an expert organization. And I would really encourage everyone today to, to reach out to ASTM, get a membership and download these standards so that you can understand what tests to do, what methods to follow and, and what I, how I should interpret those results. Um, just as an overview here, um, these in-service guidelines are of great uh, help. Um, ASTM D4378-20 is the in-service guideline for gas turbines, steam turbines, and ancillary equipment like compressors, okay? The dash 20 in this case represents the year that that standard was last updated, okay? So um, ASTM is required to update the standards on a calendar basis um, every so many years. So in this case, you can see that the testing standard is really recent and, and that's great. Uh, if it was a dash 14 or dash 15, you'd probably want to do some in, in additional investigation to understand what the, the, tr the trends have been since that last publication. But in this case, we have a brand new standard. Um, ASTM D8323 um, is for control fluids, uh, EHC systems using synthetic fire resistant lubricants. This is for anyone using these fluids, they don't have to be difficult to maintain or use, but for whatever reason, because they're so different than other lube oil or uh, so different than lube oil applications. Um, a lot of people struggle with synthetic lubricants. Okay, um, and you don't need to um, get the in-service guideline, and it will provide a reference point for you in a in a focal point and direction on how you move forward. And for every other piece of equipment, we have ASTM D six six two two four. Okay. So I've already alluded to this, but. Um, the standard would look something like this, and it would it would it would set a target value, a warning limit, um, when to test for something, um, and even suggest corrective actions in some case in terms of the in-service guidelines. So, um, I'm I'm sort of giving you all my secrets here today. But when I go to a plant. Um, in any country and they're having problems with an application, I'll always go back to what does ASTM say for this application? And then I'll compare the lubricant uh, analysis being done at site to that standard. And I will tell them you need to, you're not testing for these three or four additional things. You, you need to test those additional things. You need to interpret them according to these guidelines and, and we can help you then achieve those. So. So just looking at some oil analysis, uh, some of the important questions we have to answer is, is the oil um, correct for its job? Um, are the physical properties correct? And, I've, and I have mentioned that viscosity is number one. We can't fix viscosity. So I always look at that, first of all. Um, I, I guess, let me move a step backwards first. I'm jumping a little bit all over the place. Um, you see these target values that are listed here? Um, these target values, should actually be new oil standards in combination with uh, ASTM guidelines. 
but quite often what happens is the lab will select a reference point for you that may be inaccurate or just incorrect. Um, I always like sending my own sample in from a new drum and testing that and then using that as my in-service guideline as compared to new, new fluid. And then um, I will look at the ACM guidelines to, to set warning limits. Um, quite often I see, I'd say a third of the time, number one problem with lubricant analysis is that the, the reference point is in, doesn't exist or it's incorrect. And, and things like RPVOT, or um, that's a great example actually, um, that's a very expensive test and that could be maybe $400. And if there's not a reference guideline to that test, then any, any result is meaningless. So that certain oil tests can only be interpreted relative to a standard um, as a reference point. And if that doesn't exist, then you can't get any value from that number because the number is completely meaningless without that reference point, okay? Um, so looking at, will uh, could, an, could an immediate failure occur? Uh, two things I look at that. I look at uh, viscosity, I look at physical contamination, and then I look at things like additive levels. And if your oil has no additives in it, I mean, right now, the, the, the condemning limit for a lubricant is when the additives are less than 25% of the new value in combination with a 300% increase in acid number, okay? So if you have both of those conditions and you'd be surprised, I see this all the time, that you have to go back to a customer and says, oh, your extraction compressor at your refinery, the, the oil should have been changed last year. And people are like, how can you know that? And it's like, well, it's simple. It's really getting your references correct, getting the right test done at the right time. Um, so, so another question we always get is, how long will my oil last? And I've learned this trick from the nuclear uh, power stations, actually. They, they uh, can only change or add oil generally every 18 months. And um, because of that, the maintenance is planned normally two cycles ahead. So that would be 36 months ahead. So the question is, in 36 months from now, will my oil last until then, or do I need to replace it before that? And, and that question is really straightforward, actually. It's like, if my oil is currently um, five years old and I've lost 50% of my additives, then you could do the math and go, well, if things continued in the same methodology, it's gonna be impossible to, to be above 25% additive levels in five years from now, okay? Or three years from now is gonna be very close to that. So what is my rate of annual additive consumption? Okay, because without additives, your lubricant will fail. So in this situation, um, in this application, specifically compressors, turbine lubricants, we want to make sure that our additive levels are above that 25%. And we want to see the horizon here and be able to predict that out uh, at least three years ahead of time. And in that manner, we can start to align the maintenance windows on the equipment to the oil life. So in an LNG plant, this would be another great example. Um, in an LNG plant, because things are in series orientation, we might have three critical machines in series that are consuming the lubricant at different rates. Um, in this situation, you, you want to understand each of those three, um, how quickly the, the life cycle of the oil is being consumed and, and put some preventative measures in there um, to, to find the constraint and, and resolve that constraint so that all three of those machines now would be running at a, a similar oil life um, yeah, projection. Um, you'd be surprised. I was at a 500 megawatt plant last month and um, they were in a major overhaul, assuming the oil was gonna last four more years and they only had 30% out of left. So in this situation, you're like, well, no, your oil can't last another four years. So it's so important I guess this is the biggest point in the presentation. You need to see the horizon on the, uh, in your machine, in the lubricants in your machine, and understand what the future holds for that machine, okay? Because we can take corrective actions years ahead of time before failures will occur normally, okay?
I've been jumping around a little bit today. So I guess moving back to viscosity, it's our most important lubricant property. Um, you would assume that you're using the correct viscosity, but don't assume that. I've seen machines using the wrong viscosity. Um, it seems impossible that this situation could exist, but I'm always going back to what does the manufacturer of the equipment say I should be using? And am I, and am I using that equipment in, in, in a normal mode? Like what is the oil operating temperature? Okay. Quite often I'll see, if you see an oil reservoir with a, uh, a temperature of 80 degrees C, that's suggesting that there's a very big problem in that system. You know, I know that it can be up to 50 degrees outside in some, in some of the countries that you guys are in, um, but 80 degrees C in your reservoir would not be normal, okay? Um, I would be jumping out right away to say, is my viscosity correct, okay? Um, operating temperatures is a very really big thing. For every increase in 10 degrees Celsius, you're going to cut the oil life in half, okay? So if you go up 20 degrees Celsius from normal, you're cutting your oil life from 100% to 25%, and that's before you even start, okay? So we, we need to know that the oil we're using, the viscosity we're using is correct for the application and temperature where it's being used. So always go back to the, the manufacturer of the equipment with uh, your oil supplier and, and, and make sure that that is correct, okay? So that's, that's the biggest thing. And you see the recommended limit is 10%. If you ever see a 10% variance in your viscosity, on the very first instance of it, you call the lab and you get them to retest it immediately. There can be some variance. There can be some issues with the test in terms of a different operator, a different machine, a different lab. So you want to get a double confirmation. I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't take um, um, emergency measures here until which time I knew the viscosity was actually 10% too low. And as soon as I have that verified, then you would you would take corrective actions. And if my viscosity was more than 10% low, personally, I would shut the machine down and I would change the oil immediately. Okay, I would I wouldn't hesitate. I wouldn't hesitate. Okay. Could an immediate failure occur in your system? Well, I guess it depends on your application. So the short answer is absolutely yes, it's possible. So contamination in the form of particulate, water, or metals um, can, cause, can, can cause failures. I think this is the one that everyone's gonna be the most familiar with, and that's the solid contamination. And we have a very good test, uh, ISO 4406, that's gonna, everybody's familiar with this, and you're gonna quantify the, the particles by a code for the number, um, at four microns, number above six microns, and the number above 14 microns. But I, I guess a word of caution is that this isn't the actual number of particles, but a code, a code that you go to a table, which translates to the number of particles per milliliter, okay? So the big point here is every increase in, in one code is a doubling of the physical contamination, okay? So if your target is say, an 18 and you're at a 20, you have um, quite a bit more contamination than you should in that system. And the, you wouldn't want that, okay? So in this case, definitely follow this. Um, I always, I find engineers don't necessarily take this as serious as they should based on the type of application that they're running, okay? So if you have a servo valve, um, these high precision valves, um, physical contamination can destroy them very quickly. Okay, so um, ISO particle count uh, should be looked at in reference to your application and the sensitivity of the mechanical components in that application. Um, in your plant, you wanna make sure that any application that's running a journal bearing versus any application that's running a rolling element bearing are treated differently. Uh, rolling element bearings are incredibly sensitive to physical contamination because the type of lubricant regime they're doing is the lasto hydrodynamic lubrication and that the metal is actually flexing in this lubricant uh, regime and physical contamination is going to interfere with that and cause trouble. 
So in rolling element variants, you want to be very tight on your ISO particle count, the same as the servo valve application. Journal variants are a little bit more generous, but don't take that too far, okay? So obviously, you can tolerate a little bit more contamination. One thing that's interesting is particulate filters have a beta ratio. Um, don't look at the filter according to the micron rating that it's being sold as, okay? So, for example, um, um, I see customers that have hundreds of large uh, industrial gas turbines using journal bearings, and the requirement in a journal bearing application would be to make sure that the filters are removing everything 14 microns and above, okay? Absolute. The problem is filters are being sold according to uh, a nominal rating, which is not reflective of the real particulate filter rating. Okay, so um, I guess to explain the point a bit more. So if we have a journal bearing that requires 14 micron filtration, um, yet the industry is buying a five micron filter, and this does not reflect its true micron rating, we get this mismatch. So, in some cases, I'll actually tell the customer your filtration is substandard and to improve it, you need to switch from a 5 micron low efficiency to say uh, an 8 micron high efficiency. And people always ask, well, why would I want to increase the micron rating of my filter? And it's like the point on that is, well, the micron rating of your existing filter is completely arbitrary and doesn't mean anything, right? So we're talking about the true filter rating at beta 1000, 2000, or even 4000 now. Um, I would put in 10 micron filter, beta 4000 rating. That means that only one out of 4000 particles above 10 microns will actually get through that filter. So um, I, I see this all the time. So go back to the, to the application you're using, the, the type of equipment you're using, what does my manufacturer say I should be at. And if you can't achieve those numbers, it's because the efficiency of your filter is incorrect, not necessarily the micron rating of it, okay? So again, look for the the, the real micron rating would be at beta, well, I think we're at beta two to 4,000 right now as industry standard. Um, well, we've sort of mentioned this, but, uh, I, I like this. Uh, an ISO code 25 would be 512 times worse than a 16. So that's just the point. Because I have seen samples where I come back to the customer and says, well, you're at a 22. And they say, oh, so I'm just a little bit above spec. And I said, no, that would translate to about 2,000% or 200,000% above where you should be. And then they, they, they can't believe it, right? So be careful with these codes. These codes... Uh, double for every increase in one. The nice thing about physical contamination is that it's easy to remove with uh, hundreds of different devices and technologies. Okay, so generally we'd be using uh, filter carts, high efficiency filters, uh, filters whose properties don't change under changes in flow, pressure, temperature, um, or water content. Um, these Inexpensive filters that are made from cellulose should never be used in a critical application. Um, cellulose is an incredible material, and um, we've used it for thousands of years to filter things, okay? Um, the problem with cellulose is that its physical properties change when it comes into contact with moisture. And when it comes into contact with moisture, it swells. And the pores inside that material then increase proportionally in size to the rate of swelling. So that means that the micron rating of the filter and the efficiency is changing when it comes into contact with water. And this is not something that we want. So we always advocate for the use of microglass filters. And we would replace cellulose filters at every single installation where they exist in our plant. Because cellulose's properties will change with water, which is completely unacceptable in critical mechanical systems. Okay, so moving to microglass, we'll get a consistent um, beta ratio, regardless of what the water is. Okay, so um, that's the benefit because the the physical properties of the microglass filters aren't changing. Um, B 
be very careful with your filter carts that you don't mix lubricants. I see this all the time is that we'll take an RNO lubricant, which is for turbines and compressors, and we'll use it on a hydraulic application or vice versa. And then all of a sudden you have zinc in your turbine oil, which you don't want. Um, I'm sure everybody's aware of that already. Um, the velocity for the filter carts um, can be sized appropriately based on the volume that you have. Okay, don't apply a 1 GPM or 4, 4 LPM filter cart to a 10,000 liter reservoir. Okay, uh, there's some rules of thumb in industry on how to do that. Water. Um, the next most common physical contaminant we see is water. And the reason we care about water is because um, if it increases beyond a certain threshold, then you're going to get water into your bearings and you're going to wipe them out, right? Normally, that's not the case, but water is very destructive and harmful to the lubricant itself. I mean, this point is pretty obvious. And, and I, I guess the main wisdom I could give you on this one is that uh, understand what form your water is in. So um, just like in other contaminant types, the lubricant has a certain capacity to hold water in the dissolved form. And, and when the molecules are separated uh, uh, based on their concentration um, and they don't come into contact each other, the, the water is going to be dissolved in the system. Okay, so um, filters cannot remove dissolved water. Okay, so if your water is in the dissolved form, uh, it's most ideally removed with a dry gas blanket. Okay. Um, however, dry gas blanket technologies can only work to a certain level. Okay, so if your rate of ingress in water, say, was more than um, 50 ppm per day, 100 ppm per day, a dry gas blanket is not going to not going to work for you. Um, you're going to need, um, uh, depending on your application, either a vacuum dehydrator, an oil coalescing system, or some other format. Okay. Um, and I guess that's a, that, that lends itself nicely into the next part of the discussion. If you had an ingress rate of uh, 5,000 ppm a day, or even 10,000, the only way to remove that is gonna be a coalescer. So each water removal technology has its sweet spot, and you wanna make sure that the sweet spot of that equipment is, is, is being used in the application where you're using it, okay? Um, don't remove a tool that only removes free water, like a coalescer to try and remove dissolved water um, or try to remove only a little bit of water. So the right tool for the right job will let you uh, make great progress in managing water at your plant. Uh, steam turbine lubricants all require a dedicated permanent water removal system, okay? It's the number one pathway to failure in that application. You would just install it. Um, I'm always surprised when I see a, a new steam turbine application where there's not a dedicated water removal machine. It is absolutely essential in that application, okay? Um, crackle test. We don't see much of this anymore, but in say um, heavy machinery or in um, uh, manufacturing industry, crackle test is really great because you can do it on site and you just drop one drop of oil onto a griddle and that hot plate, if if um, if it bounces, you know that there's water in it, right? So a uh, high level of water in it. So this is not normally effective anymore in um, critical machines. So in critical machines, we'd want to use uh, Carl Fisher um, water, and that's going to be a titration, and it's going to tell us really precisely within probably five to ten ppm how much water is in that system. Okay. Uh, online sensors are great, but they don't replace traditional oil analysis. Okay, so um, if you have a sensor on site, it's going to values are going to change according to the temperature of the oil. If your oil is at a constant temperature, make sure you do check that two lab analysis so that you can understand what the RH means. Okay, relative humidity is RH, but that's not going to normally correspond directly with a part per million. But you might be able to establish, well, if my RH is 40% and my lab analysis is telling me that my water is 300 parts per million, you can start getting an understanding of what that sensor is telling you in real life. Okay. Um, the limits for water vary by the application. 
Um, I would refer to ASTM for how much water is my limit in this application. And I also look at my, my manufacturing, um, my manufacturers in service limits. Um, in a steam turbine oil system, you know, the first 50 ppm is going to be dissolved. You're not going to get free water probably till 200 ppm or higher. And I could be wrong on that point. But free water um, would normally easily separate from the oil and could be ripped out with an oil coalescing system quite easily. Um, the problem is if you get a lot of oxidation material in that oil, the polarity of these mixtures start to interfere with each other and interfere with water separation. Because water is polar and because oxidation material is polar, you're gonna get a scenario where the water is more attracted to the oxidation material than it is to the oil itself. And in this application, they will not separate anymore. Um, that being said, if you remove the oxidation material, then those two uh, would separate naturally, okay? So if you have an oil coalescing system that's not working great um, because of water separation issues, it's because you normally have too much oxidation material in your oil. Uh, there can be other specialized scenarios in this as well. Uh, emulsions would be, um, very difficult to manage normally, okay? The worst case scenario would be to get an emulsion through our bearings. Um, we can separate the free water out and make sure that our oil inlet to the bearings is, is, is not taking in free water, but an emulsion could get sucked into the bearings. So we test water separa uh, separation to make sure that we don't have emulsions. When we do have emulsions, we need to take corrective actions relatively quickly because emulsions would be very harmful to our system. I just wanted to introduce very briefly uh, ion exchange resin technology. Um, ion exchange resin technology is the inverse or opposite of particulate removal technology. Ion exchange technology would remove salt from seawater, and I guess that's the best analogy I keep coming back to. And we can use that to target it to remove oxidation materials, acids, and the contamination that causes emulsions. So um, it's in the gas turbine application and steam turbine application would be recommended. Um, in synthetic oils, it would be recommended. And in some other specialized applications, it would be recommended. Um, I just, we just have some data here that shows that the ability for ion exchange resin technology to remove emulsions is quite significant. We see a lot of centrifuges still used in water removal. Centrifuges would be ideally suited for higher water levels. Um, typically, the industry has moved to either vacuum dehydration or centrifuges for applications with high levels of water. For, for low levels of water, we'd use dry gas blankets. Metals. Uh, in some synthetic lubricants, um, they're extraordinarily sensitive to metal contamination, okay? And in other lubricants, less. Um, but we also, uh, it's a very simple test. It's about $14. You can do a spectrographical analysis of your system, which is like a fingerprint. And you can actually compare that to your new oil standard to see what contamination is increasing in your system. So I, I really do love this test and I would recommend it almost for every oil application in critical machine. Sometimes the filters, and if you have acid removal filters in your system, um, those can contribute metals to your fluid that will act as a catalyst to increase the breakdown. So in that case, you want to measure them, another benefit. So future failure, acids and varnish. I, I'd say uh, varnish would be the more likely cause of um, a mechanical failure. Um, acids, though, should be very stable in your lubricants. Um, if you had an acid number 0 0.05, 0 0.06 as a new fluid, you want to see a very, very gradual increase in that acid number over its life. If you see a, a large spike in acid number, that would be a very bad indication that something serious is happening. Typically, the base oils are, especially the group two and beyond oils, are very, very stable, and you'd not expect to see um, sharp acid changes. So that would be one of those variables you just want to see nice and steady. Now, there's different types of testing for acid number. There's um, um, a 
potentiometric, which is an electrical test, and then there is a visual method, okay? And I guess I just want to caution you that the visual method does not report strong acids, which would be abnormal. So I always do recommend to customers that they do the, the first method, which is the potentiometric, because that test method would allow you the ability to see if strong acids are present. And typically strong acids would only be present in an abnormal situation. So another indication, um, another indicator for you in, in your role. Um, ASTM says that acid numbers should be increasing by uh, less than 0.10 uh, in 20,000 hours um, and up to 0.15 um, when you're above 20,000 hours per year, okay? Um, I would say that the modern lubricants are even more stable than this, okay? Um, I've seen customers run baseload turbine applications for 10 years and still have an acid number of 0.05. So if you're having a hard time controlling your acid number, um, you know, please reach out. We might be able to offer you some advice in that regard. Um, ICB, uh, ion exchange filters or ICB filters in this case can be used to manage acid levels in gas turbines, compressors, steam turbines, control fluids. Um, outside of those applications, you generally wouldn't apply ion exchange filtration. Varnish, we'll just dive into this a little bit. Varnish is completely avoidable if you manage oxidation on your systems. If you leave it in an unmanaged situation, um, varnish is inevitable and it will occur once the oil has achieved a saturation point or its limit to hold oxidation material dissolved in the oil. After that point, it'll be converted into a solid and be attracted and deposited to metal surfaces in your system, okay? Um, when you see bearings on a, on, uh, with the varnish deposits on them, it is suggesting that the oil has been left in an unmanaged condition for an extended period, okay? And that's easily fixed and addressed nowadays. The oxidation material is polar in nature, which is based on where the electrons are spaced. Um, and the base oils are nonpolar. So you get a situation where the oxidation material is more attracted to the metal surfaces and mechanical components than it is to the oil itself. So that, that's why it's depositing at this point. The varnish test is very straightforward. You mix 50 milliliters of oil with 50 milliliters of solvent. And that solvent's purpose is to convert everything that's dissolved into that oil into a solid so that we can see it now, okay? If we didn't use the solvent, it would just be a patch test. But when we use the solvent, it allows it to be showing what that accumulated oxidation material is like. Um, we get a patch, we get a color intensity on that patch. We use an instrument photo spectrometer to measure the intensity of that patch. But what this is telling us is that the darker the stain on the patch, the higher the potential for my lubricant to form varnish. Or another way to look at this is a saturation test. How close is my oil to forming varnish? The more saturated your oil is, the more likely it is to create varnish. So um, this is not like an isoparticle count where you wanna be below a certain number. Um, I would argue that you want a white patch all the time. And when you have a white patch all the time, you can't have varnish in your system. It would be impossible some minor exceptions in process gas applications, but normally a uh, bright white patch is gonna make it impossible for deposits to form in your system, okay? The test was updated last year. Um, I would make sure that your lab is doing the correct test method, okay? There's a lot of variability in this test, and if you can't um, confirm your lab is following the DASH-21 standard, you could be getting false positives and and not be able to see the real issues on your system. I've seen it go both ways where the people are applying maintenance where it's not needed. And I also see the inverse where maintenance is not being applied where it is needed. So to see the horizon on this, you need to be doing this test method to the dash two one standard, okay? If you don't, um, you can get this degree of variability between two labs, okay? Which demonstrates the point. If you see black on your patch, that's because of high temperature breakdown, not chemistry breakdown. So when you see brown patches, that's reflective of chemistry breakdown and varnish tendency. Whereas you see black, that's 
the oil is being exposed to extreme temperature breakdown and is generating carbon. Uh, most labs will incorrectly flag uh, a dark black patch as the high varnish potential when in fact it's high temperature breakdown. I like to suggest that this is an engineering problem where the high temperature, which is why the high temperature is forming versus a chemistry problem, which is more expected in normal breakdown on the right. There's different color. There's different. This is the formula to for varnish potential and the A and the B would generate the brown patches and the L would generate the black patches. OK, so just to be aware that this is how the, the varnish test number is generated. So I like separating them into the three, the three categories, good, poor, and then poor because of high temperature breakdown. That will allow you to dial in where you're having engineering issues, okay? Versus chemistry issues. Um, we use the ion exchange resin uh, to remove all that breakdown material in the dissolved form and manage the chemistry and the oxidation of the fluids. In this regard, you can maintain a bright white patch all the time, which will allow you to have um, the same lubricant properties under all flows, temperatures, and pressures in your, in your mechanical system, which is, which is ideal. If you have uh, a dark patch, uh, the changing uh, temperature, flow, and pressure in your system can force that onto the mechanical surfaces, okay? We got a couple of case studies here to show you the difference between a customer that had high temperature breakdown, which was solved, and then we dealt with the chemistry. And then finally, we got the, the, the nice, well, in this case, a little bit brown, but still a nice light patch. Um, the color doesn't tell you concentration. In that case, we use uh, weights. So the combination of both uh, varnish potential with weight will, will give you both what my varnish potential is, but also how high the concentration is. And that allows us to measure severity. Um, just to demonstrate the ability of the ion exchange resins, they're quite extraordinary in, in, in maintaining bright white patches. And, and I would encourage everyone to look at that. This is, this is an avoidable failure that, that does not need to exist anymore in business. We've talked about how long my oil will last. I only have a few minutes left in the presentation. So I'm going to move forward. Um, linear sweep voltometry is a method that we can use to measure the percentage of remaining additive. Um, some people call this the ruler instrument. Uh, the ASTM standard is 6971. And I would recommend this test in all critical applications so that you can uh, predict end of life in your oil years ahead of time. One of the benefits of applying ion exchange resin technology to lubricants is that when you remove the oxidation material and you manage effectively oxidation, the rate at which lubricant additives are consumed will greatly decrease. Okay, so instead of losing 15% of your additive per year, we could get that into a highly managed condition of less than 5% per year, which would translate to a 20 year oil life normally. Final considerations. You know, no test is perfect. Understand the variable, the variability in each test method. Get correct baselines. Um, understand the repeatability. What the variances for ASTM are, um, and and examine the results in those contexts. And you can understand when you need to call the lab for a verification and when you don't. Okay, this will provide great confidence in your program. Understanding, distinguishing between a real variance and a variance that's within the test method. Different labs, different operators will produce different results. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, pick a good lab that you're familiar with and comfortable with. And once they confirm that you're, they're doing the correct tests with the correct test methods, um, you should get some great confidence from the data that you're getting from your lab. Uh, if you need help, ask for questions, okay? There's, there's no, it's not a sign of weakness if you have questions. This is how I've approached the, 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 um, the applications and everything that I've learned in this, okay? So ask lots of questions. If we can help with our lab, we'd be pleased to point you in the right direction. In summary, um, use oil analysis to, to answer questions. Um, get as much value as you can from the testing that you're already doing. Um, I would argue that generally people are significantly underspending in their lab analysis. Um, and that for a critical machine, a $50 or a 50 euro oil analysis is not even coming close to what you need to be doing. Do the full ASTM test method. 
Um, and you will that will unlock the secrets and provide the horizon so that you can see what you need to see in your critical machines. Um, we're coming to the end of the presentation. I'll just show a couple case studies here. Um, a lot of frame nine E's used in your countries, and uh, these are generally 13,000 liter systems. Um, when you apply the, the, the ion exchange technology, we call SVR in this case, uh, incredible things happen. And again, we don't see a perfect solution here, but uh, we see a significantly improved solution where we've reduced the varnish potential by about 75%. Okay. Um, in this case, this is um, the, the modern gas turbine. This is an SGT 800, and we can see the before and after with a significant, um, well, an, an incredible result in this case. We work with a number of companies uh, in the Middle East, and we're very proud of the results that we've achieved with them. Um, we would love the opportunity to um, offer direction and support to any of your existing programs that you have. Um, my colleague Kishar is available. Uh, he's based in Oman. If we can be of any service or answer any questions, he's on your time zone. It's going to be a lot easier to to get those questions. He's got all his certifications. He's he teaches lubricant training. He's he's a wealth of knowledge and information. Um, Thank you so much, Peter. You've done a great job. Uh, this is Moira again here. Kishar has actually been able to get on via VPN, so we're just going to allow him an opportunity just to say thank you to everyone. And again, yes, his contact is there. But Kishar, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, you have control. Uh, hello, hello everybody. Thanks, Peter, for joining and backing up. I'm sorry I had an issue with my internet, and then uh, this session I. I worked on it around two months and thanks for the 81 who joined. And this was a joint presentation. Every slide we prepared together with Peter. So uh, just Peter, if you can show those slides, which recently came to me that uh, these are from compressors and turbines in the area where, where I am getting a lot of uh, photos coming from varnish and coming from oxidation issues. But uh, really, the labs in the area are just uh, are not just sharing the data, or people are not certified, or that they are not really making actions on uh, on that. So uh, we are available uh, anytime uh, you need any support, and then we are developing our partners in the area. We have now partners in Iraq, in UAE, uh, in uh, Kuwait, in uh, Bahrain, in Saudi, and soon coming up in Egypt as well. So, if you need to talk to us directly, you can approach or uh, or distributors in the area. Yeah, these these, these are the uh, recent cases which I'm working on Siemens uh, turbine and as well as some compressors uh, with the uh, recent problems. And even some of them, they have a varnish removal system from one of our competitors, which still after two years of operation still there is some issue and then uh, one of the things we are doing is increasing the knowledge of the customer at the first stage and then coming up with the solution thanks everyone coming up i'm very sorry i had an internet issue peter thank you for the backup there's been a couple of questions here um do we have to, if we have a few minutes to answer these questions i we can start um, we have a great question on the certification for labs and ISO 17025, and that's um, that is actually the standard. So, um, it, you know, I would check with your local labs to to see what standards that they're certified to. Um, there's different standards required for the calibration of equipment versus the the lab. Uh, make sure that your lab is calibrating their equipment. I'm sure they will be because under that standard, they will be required to do so. Um, and there was also a last question about uh, online oil analysis. Um, I mean, just very quickly, this is an exploding area right now. There's so many sensors coming online and the, the, it's a very dynamic situation. Um, but whatever sensor you're using, you're going to want to compare that to existing oil analysis. These sensors are not yet replacing the labs. Maybe one day they will. For now, check, your, check the levels that they're reading, compare them to your 
in-service oil analysis, your, your existing oil analysis reports and, and to understand what their variances are and how they're working for you. Quite often, the oil properties in the lab will be different than the oil properties in the service. So, so in that case, that you could get some variance. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very well, much. Thank you, thank you, thank you HR. And um, if we can be of any service to support, please, uh, please reach out. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. We are available for you. Thank you. Bye-bye.